Well, good morning once again, everybody. How's everyone doing? So good to see everyone this morning. Well, we are continuing with a series called It Is Written. And basically what we're trying to do is encourage you all to learn to get into the Bible. Uh, I, I can't tell you how important it is. Uh, there's several things that are extremely important. If you want to live a life of God that's growing and vibrant, there's a couple things you need to do once you give your life to Jesus Christ. It, is you need to be able to hear from God, from His Word. And that's the Bible. You need to know how to pray. Learn how to pray and be in fellowship. And the fourth thing is, is to begin to walk it out. And so important, and there is a famine in many ways of the Word of God. Even though we have more electronic devices, we have more opportunities for people to understand the Bible, there is a Bible literacy, uh, illiteracy that's going out in our culture today. And our job is really to help you become as, as, uh, as self-sustaining believers. And so we've been going through this series trying to help you and demystify the Bible and let you realize it's not that complicated. It's available to everybody. You don't need to learn it to know it. All you need to do is get into it. So our job is to help you to learn to do that. And we've been spending a great deal of time over the last uh, four or five weeks now talking about how you can trust the Bible. I'm not going to re-preach it. So go to cornerstonecheshire.com. We talk about how you can, how do you know this is the Word of God? How can you trust it? And so we talk about all those things, okay? Last week we spoke about standing on the Word of God. And today I'm going to um, go into hell, help you to interpret and understand the Bible for yourself. That's our job. My prayer is that you are looking at everything that I'm saying and making sure, not to find fault to beat me up, okay? I don't want that. But to make sure what I'm preaching and teaching is accurate. That it is not something, because I'll get it wrong once in a while. We will. And to make sure that the Bible is true, okay? So let's get right into our theme verses, and then we're going to launch into today's How to Understand the Bible today for yourself, okay? First of all, we've been mentioning week in, week out, it's the Word of God that holds the universe together. For by Him, this is Jesus, for by Jesus, Colossians 1.16, the Apostle Paul talks about this. For by Him, all things are created through Jesus in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. He is the one that made it all happen, right? And in him, all things hold together. This is so important that it's actually Jesus is the mortar that holds you together. He's the mortar that holds the molecular structure of your body, of these chairs that you're walking. He holds the universe together. And we've been mentioning weekend, week out, weekend. That there is something that holds it all together. The scientists realize that. They say, we don't know what it is. It's the Spirit of Christ. Amazingly enough, before science became a, 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 something that became known in a scientific method, the Bible talks about who that is. That's the Spirit of Christ. Not only does the Spirit of Christ hold you together, but it also holds us together in what it says for us to do. You violate the Word of God, and you violate God's way. What you are doing is pulling yourself apart where things fall apart. We spent last week, we showed a tower and what happens when you pull things out, okay? So important that we understand that because everyone who hears these words, this is Jesus speaking, and puts them into practice. This is the hard part. A lot of people can hear the Word of God, can recite the Word of God, and, but do you put them into practice? Do I put them into practice? You see, God's not impressed with us knowledge. He's impressed with action. The Word in action. And so that's what we want to be able to do, is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. I want to just uh, help you guys understand a little bit, if you, how many people like steak here? Okay, how many of you are vegetarians? We'll pray for you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I, we love vegetarians. I'm a vegetarian, but I eat meat. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's great. Great for you. Anyhow, but if, if I went to a, a, a restaurant, and let's suppose I went to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and uh, I would sit there, and there's a steak before me. And I can tell you, yeah, this is a steak right there. I see it. It's cooked. It's medium, it's medium rare. It's fantastic. It's right there. And I, I could begin to describe to you that, uh, where it came from. I'd ask the, where they got the cow from, where they killed the slaughter of the cow, where they aged the meat, and where, how it was, the, how it was uh, brought here, not frozen, and how it's only uh, X amount of days old, and how they cooked it, and what the chef used, and how they seared it. And then they put all this butter all over it. And salt, godly things. Butter and salt are very godly. Anyhow, so uh, 
I'm just joking. But I could talk about how the steak came into being, how good it is, the protein value, how many calories in it. And I can sit there and I can describe it to you. And I'm sitting there and sitting there. All of a sudden my son, Luke, takes some steak, cuts it and eats it. Guess who, had, guess who knows the steak? My son. If all I'm doing is talking about it, looking at it, examining it, and it reminds me of about letting God's word transform us. Well, how do we let God's word transform us? And I was just reading this past week. I'm going through the Bible in a year, and I'm not trying to brag. I'm trying to encourage you. I've been doing it now for over 20 years. And the method I use, not the only method, but I like the method. I'll tell you the reason why. Is because I go through a one-year Bible where I do the Old Testament, New Testament, a Psalm, and a Proverb. Because sometimes you get stuck in numbers. Okay? And God will speak to you through numbers. So he spoke to me through, uh, through various things. As a matter of fact, one time I was speak, uh, reading about the Bible about how to get rid of excrement. What? Yeah. And I read it, and it says, you shall not defile what's holy. And it just spoke to me that we need to take God's presence seriously. And so it spoke to me, what I've read about many times before. But this past week, I was reading this, this passage of Scripture. And it actually speaks to what we're talking about. In fact... I appreciate God giving me an illustration about eating, because here it is. This is Ezekiel, who is in captivity when the Babylonians came. Uh, some are still in Judah and the rest are in, 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 um, in Babylon. So anyhow, this is what he says. Okay, he's a priest. He says, and, this is, and he, that's God, said to me, son of man, eat whatever you find here. And God would say to you as well, eat whatever you find here. Don't just smell it. Don't just describe it. Don't talk about how it's cooked. Don't talk about how the uh, uh, meat is aged. you got to eat it. Well, how do you eat it? Well, if you're like me, I I'm the youngest of three boys in my family. My brother's seven years older. My older brother, the other one's four. So I had to learn how to be like a monkey and grab things quick and swallow them before my other brothers got there. So if I was a steak, I would probably swallow the steak almost like a snake swallows a pig. Have you ever seen that? It's very interesting. Don't look at it on the Internet. Okay. But I would do that. But, you know, in order to eat, what do you have to do? Yeah, that's you. You have to break it down, okay? So we're going to get to that illustration in a few moments. But here is God speaking. Eat this scroll. What's the scroll? The scroll is the word. Eat the scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Now, that's what I try to do. I try to eat this and speak what it says. I try to eat it, not just talk about it, but experience God. Ingest it in you, right? Eat this scroll and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat, and he ate it. My friends, that's what God wants us to do. The problem is we don't know how to eat it. I, I don't even know if I should. How do I eat it? It's a, I can't fit it in my mouth. What I encourage you to do is get instruments called flatware, and what you want to do is you want to start cutting the meat in bite-sized bites so you can eat it and so what I want to do today is help you that you have the steak on, or I'm sorry you have the um, eggplant parmesan because I want to be fair to everyone you have it on your plate now how do you eat it now what do you do well we're gonna look at it right now okay keys to interpreting the Bible for yourself is called hermeneutics I know it's a Herman who not Herman Munster anyone that laughs about that I know how old you are but, or, or Nick at night, one of the two. But keys to interpreting the Bible is called hermeneutics, how to understand the Bible. That's all this. And so our objective is that you become self-sustaining, growing believers that you know how to do this for yourself. So today we're going to look at some obvious ways and, and ways that help you. And someone's going to be reminding you, some of you, and some of you will be the first time you've heard this before. So, number one, get a good Bible you understand uh, last week I spent some time talking about the King James Version great version 1600s do we talk like that anymore no is it beautiful yes do people understand it yes but if you don't understand it what good is it because how can you say that it's the King James Version yeah but the King James Version is a translation from the Greek Hebrew and Aramaic it's not the original, original language, everybody. Okay, so you understand that? It's a good translation. I'm not suggesting it's not. But we don't speak the thou, thou anymore, right? So what's some good ones out there? 
Well, here's some good translations I want to recommend to you. The King James Version is good. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? Now, if I just offended you, I'm sorry. Just give me a chance and I'll offend you more. All right. <laughs> King James Version is 1600s. Uh, another good one is the New King James Version, which basically updates it into a modern language. And it does not take liberty with the Hebrew, Greek, and the Aramaic. It keeps the same pronouns and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Then you have another one that's pretty decent. Is in actually very good, actually. New American Standard, which was updated in 1995. And it's very, very good. It's very literal to the original. It tends to write things out kind of in a wooden fashion. It's not very smooth, but it's good for study. Okay? Another one that I'm not as fond of. Uh, actually, I like this one a lot. English Standard Version has become my go-to now. I like it a lot. It's very well done. It's very accurate to the Greek and Hebrew and the Aramaic. And then we have the New International Version, which was uh, 84 version. They have a new one called Today's NIV. I don't like it at all. They change the gender of, of many of the pronouns in Scripture, and they take too much liberty with the text. Just personally for me, they, they, I think they almost are crossing the line. Because, listen, there's even non-binary Bibles. I'm not making this up. They take all gender out of it. That's, that's, that's heresy, everybody. Okay, we're not hating anybody. That's, that's, not, that's taking the Bible and twisting it. And then there's another version that I actually like. It's called the New Living Translation. It's more of a, an equivalency. It, it's, it's, it takes a little liberty, but it brings it to today's modern English. And it's really good to read, uh, and it's good. And when it talks about uh, things, it puts a footnote and tells you the original language, which I appreciate. And it's easy to read, and it's, it's digestible. So I encourage you. I like to read this one a lot, actually. But what I'll often do is I'll go back to the English Standard or to King James or the New King James. Or actually, I just go to the Greek and Hebrew, and I'll look at uh, that. I have dictionaries and all sorts of tools that help me uh, to understand. Because sometimes things are lost in translation. So, listen, you got to get a translation you understand. Does that make sense, everybody? But make sure they're authorized and they're good. You want to screenshot this, you can. Here's some good things, okay? It's good. And if you're taking notes, please take, write this down if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, please write it down. Okay. Now, there's some study helps. A good study Bible is, is good. What's a good study Bible? Uh, the open Bible is really, really good. Um, Spirit-filled Bible is really good. But there's a problem with that. I don't like Bibles that tell me what it says. Because then it takes away the Holy Spirit's job. All right? So, for example, there was a Schofield Bible. God bless Mr. Schofield. Mr. Schofield wrote the Bible. People don't understand what the Bible was talking about, so they read the notes. And a whole generation of believers believed Mr. Schofield. And that became, they saw that as, as like, like the canon of Scripture. Because it's in the Bible. No. What I'd rather be able to do, and I encourage you to do, is read about the history. Read about what the Greek and Hebrew words are. But let the passage speak to you. Does that make sense? Okay. Don't just wait and see. It's very helpful at times. Okay. So you have a good study of Bibles. They're out there. And let me say something else about this. I, I, uh, I encourage you, get a paper Bible. Why? Well, if you're like me, and I hope you're not, uh, if you ever try to read the Bible with your electronic device, there's a couple of things that st I struggle with. Number one, I'm reading it. I have the greatest intentions. I'm reading about Melchizedek. Uh, well, I wonder what it says in the Bible about Melchizedek. So I go to Google. God bless Mr. Google. And Mr. Google brings it up, and then all of a sudden I get, Trump said this. What did Trump say now? And I'll click on that. Devotion is ruined. Now I'm into current events, right? Or I read who the new manager of the Mets is. I'll, I'll, I'll get distracted or I'll get a text message that I didn't see from last night. And then, oh my gosh, I got to pay this bill. And I'm done. So what I could do is I, if I have to, I put it on airplane mode. Okay, which is helpful. But even better than that, I want to encourage you, get a paper Bible. That way you can, like, I got to come coffee stains in here. From three years ago, and it, yeah, where's the Bible? It's on the right-hand side of First uh, Peter. There's a coffee stain at the top. What, wh where's that found? Coffee stain, right-hand side. I know where it is. Right? And, and it's, it's right here. You can write on it. And if we have an apocalyptic zombie happen, you have your Bible. So we run out of electricity. Right? So it's good. I'm joking with you. You guys are not helping me this morning. <laughs> but it's good to have paper. Okay? I'm just telling you right now. It's just something about, I'm not saying you have to, but my Lord, it's so hard to read the Bible on an electronic device with all the 
distractions. And the enemy will put stuff out there. He will. I'm looking up, I'm looking up, uh, I'm looking up Hezekiah, and I find something else. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. Another thing that I do as well is um, if you use an online Bible, the problem with that online Bible is you have to go to their server to read the Bible. What I encourage you to do is actually buy an electronic version. I have bought the Olive Tree, which is a program. I have it on my phone. I've had it for over 10 years. I'd make notes on that, and I own it so I can go back and see what I wrote. So that's helpful as well. Are you all following me? Okay. There's another reason I like electronic Bibles, because you can make the font bigger. Don't ask me why I said that. So you want good study Bibles. Uh, here's some other things that will help you. I'm telling you, this is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I wish I had this when I was in seminary or when I was growing up, when I was younger. The Bible Project. In fact, I wanted to see what, how it handled Ezekiel. Because we're going through Ezekiel right now, if you're going through the Bible in a year. did an amazing job. And it, and it does it in a creative way, and it's accurate. It's, they're, they're legit, okay? Bible Project. Great resource. And you can go on it. It's fantastic. Another thing is called version. Incredible. I am so grateful to Pastor Greg Rochelle and Life Church for, uh, subs for subsidizing this thing, the version. Amazing. Uversion.com. You can get it on your electronic device or you can look it up. What they've done is they pooled all these resources, including the Bible Project, um, around the world. Bible reading plans. I mean, you can take a picture of someone and a scripture will come up. I mean, it's amazing. I thank God for this app. It's incredible. Not only that, you can listen to the Bible. Fantastic. And it's free. Great resource. It has commentaries in it and everything. Fan, go ahead, screenshot. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. A new car. Uh, I'm not as pretty as those people in the prices, right? Okay. The other day I saw a male model. Really? Okay. Anyhow. <laughs> Let me stop before I get myself into trouble. Um, so you have your version and a good Bible program. Uh, I encourage you to do that, everybody. I have one. It's called Logos. Fan. Absolutely tastic. I have over 2,500 books on my computer. I have a library that would probably take up four or five rooms. I can hit one thing. Bam. Church fathers. I have all these people coming up. It's almost to the point where I can actually procrastinate with research. I can dive into that thing, and you, I can get lost for days. So I don't want you to get that way, but you can get a simple version for $49.95 that is very helpful. Okay, you don't have to, but it is helpful to have tools to know what the Greek and the Hebrew says. Okay, that's Logos.com. Those are my, my suggestions, okay? And now, so get a good Bible you understand. Does that make sense, everybody? I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? If you don't understand it, well, how are you going to understand it if you don't understand it? You want to write that one down, because that's pretty deep. <laughs> All right. Here is absolutely, positively, the most important thing is this number two. The Holy Spirit, the great teacher. There are, there are people, there are atheists. Um, Karl Marx memorized part of the Bible when he was growing up. Didn't do him a lot of good, did it? So it, just because you can read it, just because, no, it's not enough. You need to know what the Bible says. Because the Bible is not just a document. It's a living and it's breathing. It is. It's a living word of God. And so this is what Jesus talks about, about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit will help you through the process, okay? But the advocate, that is the Holy Spirit. By the way, you have a personal tutor. Some of you go to school and you struggle with calculus. I need to get a personal tutor. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit is your personal tutor. How would you like to have a personal tutor help you do your taxes? Wouldn't that be nice, right? Sit down with you, explain it all. What do you mean? You mean the Holy Spirit would do that? Absolutely. He does it all the time. For me, and I think some of you are nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about. Okay? So the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, which he did on the day of Pentecost, will teach you all things and will remind you. That's amazing. I'll be sitting there, oh, something, something I read uh, last year will pop up on my head. He reminds you of everything I had said to you. In 1 Corinthians 
The Apostle Paul, again, talks about the importance of the Holy Spirit helping us to understand the Word. These things God has revealed to us through what? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. I don't understand the depths of God. The Holy Spirit will do it. How do you know that? Because the Word of God is true. When you open the Word of God, get a Bible, you understand, Holy Spirit, open my eyes in what you want me to see today. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except a good scholar. Doesn't say that, does it? Someone that has a high IQ. No. Thank you for giving me the nose. I appreciate that. Thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one that understands the Word of God. Now, as we continue to read, now we have received not the spirit of the world. And this is the problem. The world will say, I don't like that. You need to look through the scriptures through the lens of the 21st century. We've evolved as a culture, really. We've really evolved well, haven't we? Yeah, we've evolved real well. You would be kidding me? The spirit of this world is a disaster, right? Now we've received the spirit of the world. No, but the spirit... Who is who? From God that we might, what? Understand, that we might hear the pastor on television. No, God wants you to understand the Bible. He wants you. And by the way, I'll, I'll share with you in a few moments. The Bible is so ridiculously simple and so ridiculously profound and so ridiculously unsearchable. Because you can go deep, deeper, and deeper, but the general message is quick, and it's easy. You don't need a special code to understand it, but the more you dig, the more it comes out. It's, it's like looking at the stars at night. Oh, there's more stars. There's, I mean, I'm telling you right now. Okay, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, and we impart this in words not taught from human wisdom, but taught by who? The Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Listen, some of you know, don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. When you read the Word of God, and you're a believer in Christ first, and all of a sudden you read it, and all of a sudden it starts talking to you. You know what I'm talking about, everybody? It starts telling you the things, that, well, you need to forgive this person, you need to do this or the other. Guess who that is speaking? That is not your conscience. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. God speaks right here. Right here. I need to hear from God. It's right here, everybody. This is above the prophetic word. This is the inerrant word of God. This is how you get, this is how you know his voice. You hear his voice by the word, all right? Now, taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit. So don't be surprised that people think we're insane. In fact, I was just reading, just yesterday, and I'm reading Ezekiel, and God tells Ezekiel, hey, Ezekiel, you're a watchman on the wall. You better tell them what I'm saying, or you're liable. And guess what the Holy Spirit said to me? Don't water it down to get more crowds. <laughs> Don't be a jerk with the truth either. There's people out there that are jerks with the truth. Be compassionate, but do not water down the word because you're liable. And my friends, I don't want to go to God one day and say, well, I didn't want to mention hell. I didn't want to mention non-binary stuff. I didn't want to mention unforgiveness. I didn't want to mention hell and heaven. Listen, we got to talk about these things. Why? Because the word of God says about it. Heaven and earth will pass away. The United States, my friends, is so terrible. You know what the United States, God, thank God for our country. You know what the United States is in, in time? If you get three 81-year-olds consecutively, that's the age of our country. That's nothing. I love the United States of America. I thank God for the United States of America. But you know what? My allegiance is to Almighty God, not the United States of America. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you the truth. Actually, I'm not sorry. It's the truth. I love the United States of America. I thank God for the United States of America. Okay? 
So let's make that clear. Okay, so a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, see? And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned. So we talked last week about this a little bit more. Get a good Bible you can understand. The Holy Spirit is the great teacher. Literally say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Open my eyes today. Let me see what you want me to see. Let me understand what you want me to understand. And give me the power, Holy Spirit, to walk in the way you've called me to walk. Okay, here's another one. Number three, read it like the first time. Because what happens is, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, who should live? We say it self, I know that already. No, you don't. Go to it like the first time. Go to it like the first time. Throw away your preconceived notions. Why is it that the Christians thought slavery was okay in America? Because we just read past it quickly. Why do we allow certain things? Because we didn't let the Word of God speak to us. Stop. Look at it as if it's your first time looking at it, everybody. Let go of the bias. The truth is this. Everyone's biased. I don't care how hard you try not to be biased. You're biased. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. How can you say that? Because we're all biased. It's, it's really a matter of, the, of how, how much of the degrees, how many degrees are you biased? We're all biased. So if you understand that you're biased, then you can come to the scripture and say, God, I don't want to be biased based upon what I've experienced and based upon my church. What are you saying in the word here, God? Look at it as if it is your first time. That's really important to do that. Here's another one, number four, very important. Context is absolutely critical. You can buy a house on the interior of some place, and you can buy a house in New Mexico in the middle of the desert that's 5,000 square foot, and you can probably buy it for maybe $85,000. You take that same house, and you put it in Old Saybrook, right on the Long Island Sound, it's $5 million. Context is everything. So context is very important in understanding Scripture. And what is the context? I want to help you. Context is absolutely critical. Here's some things you want to ask. You want to become an investigative reporter. Because a real reporter does not, a real good reporter is not supposed to have an agenda. A reporter is supposed to go out, gather, the, just, the, just the facts, ma'am. Supposed to gather the facts. And re withhold judgment and interpretation. Gather the facts, please. Don't cook the meal. Gather the ingredients. Then figure it out. Why do you keep talking about food all the time? You have an issue with food. Okay, I do. I have to eat to stay alive. All right. It's like the man that struggles with drinking. How do you get to my house? Oh, turn right at the liquor store. Then at the uh, drugstore, make a left. At the other liquor store, over here, at the bar, you make a right. Okay. <laughs> Be like an investigative reporter. Ask the question, who? Who? Who is this written to? Who is this for? All the Bible is written for us, but not all the Bible was written to us. There are certain things the Bible talks about. For example, in the in, uh, Old Testament, in the um, first five books of the Old Testament, it talks about not eating shellfish. That is to them. Okay, we talked about ceremonial law, civil law, and moral law. Ceremonial law and civil law are for that time and that place. Moral law is, is forever. But we can learn from these principles. I don't have time to break that down further, okay? It's written to Jews, Gentiles, non-Jewish people, and the church. You have to know who it's written to. So it helps you understand the Bible, all right? So be like an investigative reporter. Ask the question, who is this to? What is going on here? What is going on? I'm going to have to go faster this. All right. When did this take place? It makes a difference when it took place. You can't judge society by today's standards 300 years ago. We know things now we didn't know back then. So you have to know when. What was going on in society back then? These are things you need to understand. Who, what, when, and then why? Why is this happening? Okay. And how? So who? What? I know this sounds like <laughs> Journalism 101. All right? It is, actually. Who, what, when, why, how. Do not try to figure it out. Just gather the facts. Gather the facts. 
And finally, here we go. How does this apply to me? It doesn't apply. Yes, it does. I tell you, almost everything in Scripture applies. The tabernacle, the, the, all the things that take place, there is a meaning behind it. I'm telling you, I don't have time today to break it all down for you, okay? So context is critical. Let the Bible interpret the Bible, okay? Now, I want to take the next time uh, of our time right now, next 10 minutes or so, I want to go through a passage of Scripture together, all right? I'm going to give you a little example of how we can break down a passage of Scripture and get something out of it. You all with me? Y'all with me? Okay. I spent some time in Virginia. Sorry. <laughs> Matthew 18, 21. This is Jesus now speaking to Peter. And by the way, it's good to go like this. Let's open the Bible to Matthew 18. Let me see here. Matthew 18. Okay, what's the context of this? Uh, let me see where we are here. The ten transfiguration takes place. The introduction about faith. The instruction about Jesus' death. Instruction about taxes. Oh, gosh. What do you have to mention that for? And instructions about humility. Okay. And now we get to punishment of offenders. And finally here, the offended brother. And instructions about forgiveness. So now I have a little bit of an idea where I'm landing the plane. Here's the context with which, which it's found. Okay. Now, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? Wait. How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Good question, because he just talked about how to restore a fallen brother. That's the context in which this passage is found. That's why it's good to know the context. All right? I can't get all the context here on a Sunday morning, so go back and check the context in which I preach from. Okay? We can't do it right now. Okay? Lord, how often will I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? So I read that, and I say, why is he said seven times for? So I look into seven times. And because of my Bible program, I'll hit the commentary about manners and customs. And I'll find out that back in the day of Jesus, when you forgave someone three times, that was considered a big deal. That's where we get one strike, two strike, three strikes, you're out of the old ball game. I'm just kidding. That's not where we got it from. Okay. But they thought three times was a big deal. Okay. Two or three witnesses, three is a big deal. If you do it four times, wow. You're really going for it. Now, Peter's like, not four times, God. Five, six, seven. Seven times. He's thinking, wow, I got this now, Jesus. As many as seven times? Here's Jesus. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. And for you detail-oriented people, that's 490 times. And so what I'm doing, I'm making a little hashtag. Every time I forgive you for that, hashtag. Take out the garbage. Didn't do it? Hashtag. And I'll get the 490, and then you're done. No, that's not what God is talking about. When Jesus uses 7 times 70, he's actually using the number of perfection. He's actually saying unlimited. That's what he actually means. If you understand the context of what he's saying, if you understand the number system and how 7 is the number of God, then you know what he's talking about. So that's an example of how you're reading this and you can find that out a little bit more. Therefore, now Jesus goes to a parable in this teaching. He tells them how many times they're supposed to forgive. And then he, he breaks it down with an illustration. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. So stop right there. We need to understand. We don't understand kings today. Well, how do you understand kings? Well, maybe look at what the context was back in those days, right? You can read this and get a, 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 a meaning for it right off the bat. But man, when you, start, when you start doing the research, it gets deep. It's like, wow. It's, well, let me make it very clear. You can still drink from the water and get the passage to speak to you. But you can dig and dig and dig and dig. You follow what I'm saying, everybody? It's right there. It's simple, but my goodness, it's deep. Okay? So this is what happens. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And now my Bible says right here it's about 10,000 talents. It's probably about, about $100,000. Other people say it's millions of dollars. We don't know. All we know, it's a lot of money that the man cannot pay. Basically, it's like telling me to pay the national debt. I cannot pay the national Our own government can't pay the national debt. Okay? So you owe me a trillion dollars. Okay, that's basically what he's telling the man, or millions of dollars. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had. This is what they used to do in those days. You'd sell, if you couldn't pay your debts, guess what? 
They'll take your kids. You're like, please, I like that. No, no, no. They take, they take your kids, they'd repo your kids, and your kids would have to work, and you'd have to work until you paid off through servitude. That's what they did back in those days. Okay, and since they repo your house, no, they repo your kids. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. No, he won't. There's no way he could pay that debt. That's millions and millions of dollars. He works a minimum wage job. There's no way in a thousand years he could pay it back. So he's making a promise he cannot keep. But he's begging. He's crying. And so what does, the, what does the king do? And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. You're free. Go. Now, you'd think the guy would be pretty happy about that, right? No. Look what happens next. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants. So this guy's working for the king, and this guy has servants below him. Found a servant, went out, and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is basically a week's wages. Let's say 500 to 700 bucks he owes him. That's it. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, did the exact same thing this man did. Have patience with me, and I'll pay you. And by the way, the guy can pay him. It's a week's wages. It's not hard to do. Might take a little while, but he can do it. Right? Where's, where's the, what does he say? He refused and went and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. Now, if you're reading this in that time, the first century you're reading this, you understand what this is. You know, man, that's not right. You, know, you would be like, wow, because you understand the context of what's taking place even deeper than we do at reading it by ourselves. Okay? And Jesus goes on. When his fellow servants saw what was taking place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant. And I look up the word wicked, and you know what it means? Wicked. Thank you. Servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? All right? And in anger, that's right, you know God gets angry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anger, his master, delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. And you know, it says in other translations, jailers, torturers. There are people today that are delivered to torturers. You have such bitterness in your heart. Some of you have mental illness as a result of it. I'm not saying mental illness is treated because of that. But it can help cause that to happen. Some of you are literally sick, have arthritic conditions. I'm not saying arthritis is from unforgiveness. What I'm basically saying is this, that science even shows us, medical science tells you, if you're under a lot of stress, your immune system can be lowered. If your immune system is lowered, you can catch stuff easier. And so what happens is this. I don't, I don't want to forgive the person. So what happens? You're handed over to the torturers. God's like, I can't do anything with this one. He's not listening to me. So the enemy has a right to meddle in his or her affairs because they're not forgiving, because they're being wicked. I don't like that. I, I, I'm not making this up, everybody. It's right here, right? Until he should pay all his debt. So also, listen to this. My heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother, period. I wish it would stop right there, but it doesn't. If you do not forgive your brother, period. Nope. What does he do? From what? What does it say? Heart. Look up the word heart. Cardia. What does it mean? Read about it. You can go on the internet and look at what it says. Wow. Look at that. From your heart. It's almost like our kids. When we told our kids to forgive each other. I forgive you. No. Until I see, until I see real genuine forgiveness. God's saying, I want your heart changed. Not your behavior. Why is it we spend more time looking at people's behavior and don't care about the heart? So at our church, we, we, we're more interested in your heart than your behavior. Because if the heart's right, the behavior will change. We quarantine people from coming into church because of their behavior. I'm going to say something objectionable. I'm sorry. I pray we have people who don't believe in God come to our church. 
I pray we have drug addicts come to our church. I pray we have people that are living together come to our church. I pray we have homosexuals come to our church. Why? Because God loves them. And their behavior is not what we're after. What we're after is their hearts. Behavior is secondary, everybody. Okay? Get off the religious kick. Get off a religious high horse. Stop looking at behavior matters. I understand that. But go to the heart of it. I've never changed without changing my heart. Just saying. So, now, we're not done yet. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. What's that all about? Well, if you read the context of 1 Corinthians, it says, if you do not discern the body of Christ rightly, you are drinking condemnation on yourself. And the context of that is this. If you don't forgive others as God's forgiven you, some of you are sick because of it and have even died. So don't take communion lightly. Whoa. Come on. How can God say that? I'm not done. There's more. There's more. Matthew 6, 11 through 15. This is Jesus now giving the greatest prayer, the daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. Every day we need daily bread. Now, he, when he does, he puts a conjunction there. And even in the Greek, there's a conjunction. And forgive. So daily forgiveness and daily bread both are important. This is what you get from studying the original language. Okay? And forgive us, or even the English language for that matter. It's a conjunction. And forgive us our debts as what? As we've forgiven our debtors. So God, forgive me like I forgive others. No, we're not done. There's more. He goes on and says, and lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. How is he going to deliver us from evil if we hadn't forgiven? Do so you see that, everybody? All right? We're not done. There's more. For if you forgive others their trespasses, which means sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't want to find out. Do you? One saved, always say, you want to play Russian roulette? I don't want to do that. If that's your attitude, you're probably not even saved in the first place. So we're not going to get into that. It's just immaterial. You need to forgive. Or you'll be handed over to the torturers and God won't forgive you. What are the implications? I don't want to find out the implications, do you? I want to conclude our time here today with something extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. There was a police officer named Amber Geiger. And she was coming home from work, off-duty police officer. She came to her apartment complex. She got off at the wrong floor. She thought she was going into her apartment, but she didn't. Even though it had a red carpeting, it was different. It was extremely careless. Extremely careless. She walks in. There's an, there's an unarmed black man just having ice cream. 26-year-old. Just having ice cream. She does something unthinkable. He pulls out her gun and shoots her. Right? Now, I know I'm just, people are like, well, that's not, well, she was convicted is going to spend at least 10 years in prison. And, um, boy, I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I don't. But let me just say this. Um, I, have, I know some pastor friends of mine, and I've known some people that are African-American, and some guy, let me just talk to everybody here. We don't understand what someone goes through. These pastors shared at a conference. These are nice guys. They've got big churches. They're very successful in their communities. They got, out of, they got out of a restaurant, they're driving, they forgot to put their lights on, and they're in a white neighborhood, okay? And they get pulled over by the police. The, this is what they told me. They, they told us, not me, they told us. Our hearts were pounding in our chest. We had my, my wife in the back, my two kids in the back, and, and we were there. And we were black in a bad part of town. We weren't, dressed, we weren't dressed right. We were dressed very comfortably. And their hearts were pounding. Now, if a police officer pulls me over, my heart's still pounding because I don't want to pick it. But I'm not worried about getting shot. They are. Yeah, but they shouldn't be thinking that way. Well, whether, they think you, whether you think it's right or not, guess what? They're thinking that. Why? Because there's enough history that they've experienced, their friends have experienced, where that, that is a concern. I don't have that concern. Well, that's not right. Well, well good for you. Can we step off our high horse for a few moments? And step into, what, what did Jesus do? Philippians chapter 2. 
He became one of us. Can we stop trying to look at someone else from our vantage point and get out of our little castle and go where they are? And so they are so fearful. Say, what, what, what do I do? If I pull my wallet out, they might, they might shoot me. Now, will that happen? Perhaps not. But that's a fear they have. Why? Because circumstances happen. Are you going to talk about Black, Black Lives Matter? No. Well, I'm going to talk about this. Everyone matters to God, and there's a reason why they have that movement. Are you being political? I'm not being political. I'm being biblical. Hello? So we have this police officer who does this. Watch what takes place. I'm not going to say I hope you rot. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. This is the brother of the one that got I killed. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I don't know if this is possible, but can can I give her a hug, please? Please. Yes. Right now, he's ministering to her, whispering in her ear. <laughs> Brent John, the youngest person involved in this trial was an example to all of us mm -hmm. of what we should be. That's right. He took his brother's life, incorporated that into his thoughts, his upbringing, his belief, and wanted for Miss Geiger what he believed his brother would want for her. And I think his request to hug her, which would have been the personification of his forgiveness, I think it caught all of us off guard. I saw someone who was really, really hurting deeply. And if a hug was going to help her, I had to extend love and compassion to her. She asked me if God would forgive her. And I said, yes, I believe he will. He will forgive you. And then she said, um, well, I don't even have a Bible. I don't know where to begin. I don't have a Bible. And I just said, I'll get you one. Now, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. It's right here. It's right here. It's in the Bible. It's from the Word of God. I wish we had judges like Judge Kemp who had a fear of God. And think about it. The, the, the woman still has to serve her time. But she's forgiven. My friends, we need to forgive like that. Because God has forgiven us. You see, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I, I, I just thank you so much for your word. Lord, we want to be set free of unforgiveness. And Lord, as we study today to learn how to open your word, how to understand it by the right translation, but more importantly, Holy Spirit, letting you become our tutor. We will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. And Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And we choose to step down from our arrogance and our ignorance and come to you and say whatever you would have for us, oh God.